Welcome to the fourth lecture of my series on waves. In the previous two lectures, we have been taking a look primarily at the solutions of the wave equation in one dimension. And in particular, we have been using extensively the D'Alembert solution that u of x, t is given by a smooth function f of x minus vt plus another smooth function g of x plus vt. And we have seen that initial value problems where say the initial value of the wave at t equal to 0 is specified as u0x and its first time rate of change, the so-called velocity, is again described at t equal to 0 by v0x. Then f and g, these two smooth functions which go into the general solution, can be calculated in terms of u0 and v0 using equations like this. Now this completely characterizes the solution to the wave equation if the initial conditions are given for all x. However, you may have systems with boundaries. You can have a string which stretches from say 0 to positive infinity, just as an example. And at the end 0 comma t, the value of u is specified to be some fixed function phi of t. In such cases, f of x and g of x can be found directly from u0 and v0 only for positive x. But since in the general solution, f comes with an argument x minus vt which keeps on decreasing with t, then even for a positive x, for a sufficiently large value of t, this argument x minus vt will turn out to be negative. So you need the value of f for negative x. And we have shown that for this particular kind of boundary condition, for negative x, you could find f of x by using this formula that f of x is minus g of minus x plus this function phi of minus x by v. For a negative x, both the arguments of g and phi are positive. So they are things which are already well specified. In the first case, from the initial conditions. In the second case, simply from the way that the boundary condition is evolving with time. In today's lecture, we will look at an entirely different way of solving the one-dimensional wave equation. This is actually a very, very standard method for handling many partial differential equations. And it's called the separation of variables. The reason for this name will be clear as we proceed with the description of this method. Now the thing that we do is basically dependent on one very simple observation. Ordinary differential equations are easier to solve than partial differential equations. So our aim would be to try to change the PD that we want to solve into one or maybe more than one ODE. Now, in order to do this, what we will do is we will look for solutions of very specific kind. Now, the kind of solution that we look at can actually depend on the equation that you are working with. Different kinds of equations may need different starting propositions. However, the most common thing that people use and one which will work for the wave equation and also works for many other kinds of equations besides is the so-called multiplicative form where u of x, t, which is a function of both x and t, is written in the form of a product of a function of x, capital X of x, multiplied by a function of t, capital T of t. So for the time being, what we are going to do is take a look at whether the wave equation delta u del x2 plus 1 by v squared delta u del t2 at all has solutions of this particular product form. And if it does, what kind of equations do capital X and capital T obey? To answer the last question, all we have to do 
is to start with the U of this particular product form and use it directly into our wave equation. When we do that, what happens is the following. On the left hand side, when you are partially differentiating with respect to x twice, capital T essentially comes in as a constant. So we end up with capital T of T times d2x dx2. Note that since capital X is a function of small x and small x alone, that is, it is a function of one variable, this is no longer a partial derivative. It has been reduced to an ordinary derivative. Very similarly, for the del 2 del t2 on this right hand side, the product form capital X capital T of u leads to capital X of x times the second ordinary derivative d2 dt2 of capital T. Now, if we take these expressions and plug them into the wave equation itself, we end up with capital T times d2x dx2, which is of course this. Here all we have done is suppress the explicit display of the arguments. What we do next is divide both sides of this equation by u, that is by capital X times capital T. And when you do that, you end up with 1 over capital X, d2 capital X dx2 on the left, and 1 by v square times 1 over capital T, d2 capital T dt2 on the right. Now the important thing to note is on the left hand side, we have a function of small x alone. Whereas, on the right hand side is a function of small t alone. Now it is this separation of the equation into two halves, each one of which depends on a different independent variable that gives this method its name, separation of variables. Note that the last step that we have talked about here, namely the division by u of both sides, works in separating out the functions of different arguments in this particular case. Now for other differential equations, you may have to start with a different starting proposition instead of starting with u which is equal to capital X times capital T. And this step of division by u may or may not be necessary. The ultimate thing that you do in a separation of variables problem is simply that you somehow ensure that you have functions of one variable on one side of the equation and the function of the other variable or variables on the other side of the equation. Now the most important thing to keep in mind here is that small t and small x are independent variables, which means you can change one of them without changing the other. So, if you were to change, say, small x and small x alone, leaving small t unchanged, which you can definitely do, then the right hand side of this equation can definitely not change. Simply because small t, the variable it can depend upon, is not changing. On the other hand, because this is an equation, this means that the left hand side cannot change either. So this left hand side, which is a function of x alone, cannot change when you change x. A similar argument will tell you that the right hand side, which is a function of small t alone, cannot change when you change small t and small t only, because in that case the left hand side would stay the same and therefore to preserve the equality, the right hand side would also have to stay the same. So the upshot of all this is, the separation of variables, that is, separation of the original equation to an equation, which has two different variables on its two sides, leads to the conclusion that both sides must be equal to a single common constant. 
So while capital X is a function of X, 1 over capital X D2 capital X D small x2 must be a trivial function of small x, a function which does not change when you change small x. A similar thing, while capital T is a function of small t, this particular combination on the right hand side of the equation must be a trivial function of small t, that is, a constant. In fact, the same constant as 1 by capital X d2 capital X d small x2. So, this actually boils down to 1 over capital X d2 capital X dx2 equal to 1 over v square 1 by capital T d2 capital T dt2 equal to a constant which we have called minus k square here. Note that while k could very well have been complex and this means that minus k square does not necessarily have to be negative. It is rather obvious from the expression above that we somehow want this separation constant to be a negative real number. And that is why we have rewritten the constant there in this particular form, minus k square. So what we see is our original partial differential equation has broken down into two ordinary differential equations. The first one from here is d2 capital X dx2 is minus k square capital X. And the second one from here is very similar. d2 capital T dt2 equals minus omega square capital T, where omega is k times v. Note that the minus sign here and here are both because of the minus sign that we introduced here. We will soon see that unless we take the separation constant to be a negative constant, we might run into some kind of trouble with the initial or the boundary value conditions. Which is why we are explicitly writing this in the form of a negative constant. Now, the equations that we have obtained for capital X and capital T are very similar in form and they are actually very, very familiar equations. In fact, if you would substitute small x here in place of capital T, then this would really be the equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. In fact, both of these equations would essentially be a simple harmonic oscillator equation, except for the fact that here they are really referring to different things and not to displacement of a single point oscillator. But mathematics, of course, does not care what these variables are supposed to mean. So you can immediately solve these equations using known solutions. We all know that the solutions to the equation d2x dt2 plus omega square x equals 0 is a cos omega t plus b sine omega t. And using that, and just remembering to change the variables as and when appropriate, we can solve this equation and write down the solution. Capital X of X is some constant capital A cosine KX plus B sine KX. A and B are of course arbitrary constants at this stage. And capital T, this function of T, can also be written down in a very similar fashion. It's capital C cosine omega T plus capital D sine omega t. Again, capital C and capital D are arbitrary constants at this stage. And the product of these two functions is definitely a solution of the wave equation. This has to be the case from the way we derived it. But if you want, you can always plug this product capital X into capital T into the wave equation and see for yourself that this is actually being satisfied. However, the one major problem we would have is that the initial condition that has been specified for my problem would of course be obtained by setting t equal to 0 for u0 and differentiating first and then setting t equal to 0 for v0 and neither of those might match this functions values, the corresponding values 
which you can obtain from capital X into capital T. So this apparently is an impasse at this stage. You do have a solution to the wave equation, but that solution would usually not satisfy the initial conditions, unless you were very, very lucky. And somehow the initial conditions given actually fitted this very, very specific kind of functional form. Now, this is a general feature of the method of separation of variables. You start with a particular ansatz or prescription about the form the solution u x, t has to have, plug it into the equation, convert somehow the equation in such a form that one variable only sits on either side of the equation and then Equate those both sides to constants and you have got your ordinary differential equations. And presumably, in most situations, you should have less difficulty in solving the ordinary differential equations than directly solving the original PDE. Of course, in this particular example, solving the differential equations that you obtained were simplicity itself. However, the pitfall would be that this special form that you had to assume would usually not fit the differential conditions or the boundary conditions that have been imposed. So, it seems that the method of separation of variables, as we have described here, would be of very, very limited utility. It may just give you a solution for special equations, but even if it did, those solutions would typically not fit the boundary conditions or the initial conditions and would not be the solutions that you are looking for. The way out hinges on something called superposition. Now this can be used only because the partial differential equation that we are working with happens to belong to a very specific kind. And only this kind of partial differential equation is really amenable to this method is the kind of linear partial differential equations. Now what is important is we have not transformed our PD to two ODEs really, although it looks like that, but we have actually transformed it into an infinite set of ODEs because for each value of k I have a pair of ODEs, one for capital X, the other for capital T. And at this stage, K could be any real number whatsoever. Now the important thing that we have stated here is our equation, the wave equation, is both a linear equation and a homogeneous equation. Both of these terms should be pretty familiar to most of you. On the off chance that you are meeting these terms for the first time, let me explain what they are. The wave equation can be written in the form L u equals 0, where L is an operator which gets to act on u. And that operator for the wave equation obviously of this form, del 2 del x2 minus 1 by v square del 2 del t2. Now this is a linear operator in the sense that if you give it a combination like say C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2 where C1 and C2 are real constants and V1 and V2 are real valued functions, then the result of L acting on this combination would be C1 times L acting on V1 plus C2 times L acting on V2. Which essentially means if you have a pair of solutions u1 and u2, which satisfy the wave equation, then c1 u1 plus c2 u2 will also satisfy this. Well, if u1 and u2 satisfies the equation, then lu1 plus lu2 is 0, and hence L acting on the combination c1 u1 plus c2 u2 will give you c1 times L acting on u1 plus c2 times L acting on u2, that c1 times 0 plus c2 times 0. And hence, C1 U1 plus C2 U2 also satisfies the original equation. Note that apart from linearity, we have made use of the fact that the equation is homogeneous, that it has zero on the right hand side. 
If you take a linear combination of two solutions, what comes out after you apply the linear operator is the similar linear combination of the individual results of L acting on the functions. And since the equations has zero on the right hand side, and the linear combination of any number of zeros is zero, the linear combination of solutions is also a solution. So, our problem, that is the individual product type solution that we had used, may not satisfy the initial and or the boundary conditions, is alleviated by the fact that although an individual solution may not, we do have an infinite number of equations and hence an infinite set of solutions and the linear combination of these solutions might very well satisfy the conditions that we want to impose. We will check that that is exactly what happens in this case. To do that, we will not talk about the most general possibility, but talk about an important enough special case which we have also discussed before using the Zalimba solution. It is the problem of a string that is bound at both ends so that the boundary conditions given are u at 0, t is the same as u at l, t and they are both 0. That is, there is no displacement of the string if you are thinking of this as a wave on a string at the two endpoints. The two endpoints are fixed. Now, our life is made considerably simpler by the fact that the boundary conditions involved here are also homogeneous. That is, they have a zero value for the boundaries. Point is, if we impose the boundary conditions on each of the individual term of a sum, then the sum will also obey this particular boundary condition. So, let us demand that while we are going to superpose many, many solutions of the form capital X of small x times capital T of small t individually, each of these terms will satisfy capital X of 0, capital T of small t at all times vanish and capital X of L times capital T of small t vanish at all times too. Now, since we are demanding this happens at all times for x equal to 0 and small x equal to L, we must have capital X vanish at both small x equal to 0 and small x equal to L. Now, let's go back to the solution that we have already found out. Capital X of x is A cos kx plus B sin kx. If you demand capital X of 0 to be 0, you get immediately capital A is 0. After all, cosine becomes 1 when you put small x equals 0 and the sine term here vanishes. So, capital A is capital X of 0 and that means capital X has to be 0. Now, what about the boundary condition at small x equals L? Now, for this, what you do is plug in small x equal to L in this equation. Of course, only the B sine kx term survives since we have already seen that capital X A is 0. So, you end up with B sine KL equals 0. Now, one might be tempted to use B equal to 0 as well, but that would mean that the capital X of X term that you are getting is identically 0, or the solution capital X of small x times capital T of small t, which contributes a part to the sum which makes up the full solution, will actually not contribute anything at all. So, you cannot take capital B to be 0. The only other option, of course, is to take sine small k times capital L equals 0. And this means capital L being fixed, small k cannot take an arbitrary value. KL, the product, has to be an integer multiple of pi. And Therefore, small k is of the form n pi over L with n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Now, you might very well ask this question at this stage. Why only these values of the integer small n? That is, why only positive integers? Why not small n equals 0? 
or small n equals minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, etc. The negative integers. We will explain that soon. But before we do that, let us take a look at what exactly the solution capital X of small x times capital T of small t look like once you have put in the fact that capital A is 0 and small k is n pi over L. Then the solution simply becomes B sine n pi small x by L. Since we know k is n pi over L, I have replaced k by n pi over L everywhere here, times capital C cosine n pi v over L t. Remember this was omega t, but omega was kv, and therefore omega is also n pi v over L, plus d sine n pi v over L times t. And what we can always do is absorb this constant b into the constant C here and into the constant D here and call the resulting products capital B, capital C and capital B, capital D simply small a and small b. So one individual term which will be part of the linear combination which ultimately will satisfy the initial conditions is of this particular form. Sin n pi x over L a is cosine n pi v over L t plus b sine n pi v over L t. What is important is that we can actually consider the superposition of all these solutions. So u x comma t is a sum from n equals 1 to infinity of sine n pi x pi capital L times a n cosine n pi v over L t plus b n sine n pi v over L t. So essentially the solution that we had found out, we are putting this back into the sum which gives you u x comma t. And basically for each n you have a solution and that solution has a constant a and a constant b. I have called them a small n and b small n. Using this, we have got the final form, a solution to the wave equation, which is consistent with the boundary condition that we have employed. But we are still a long way from claiming that this is a solution to the problem. In order that this be a solution to the problem, you should be able to find out a n's and b n's, this twice infinite sequence of coefficients. What we have to do is change the a n and b n according to our needs, in particular to choose them in such a way that u naught of x and v naught of x can be reproduced. So now you have a solution to the wave equation. If you manage to reproduce the initial conditions, then you actually have the complete solution at all positive times. First, let us answer this pending question. We wrote down the solution in this form where we let n go from 1 to infinity. But why not let n go from minus infinity to plus infinity? This is of course the old question that was asked a while ago. What about negative integer n's or what about 0? Why do we discard them when we write a solution like this? Now to understand that, let us focus on this solution which is, by the way, a valid solution of the wave equation, subject to our boundary conditions. Let us focus now on one term of the solution. Let's just say the one for small n equals capital N. Of course, the term that this gives us is simply the same expression as this, but with small n replaced by capital N. Now, in addition to that, in this sum we will also have Another term corresponding to small n equals minus capital N. Again, a very similar term, of course, minus capital N sitting everywhere where small n was in this whole expression. So the coefficients become a minus capital N and so on. Now, given the fact that cosine of minus theta is cosine theta, 
and sine of minus theta is minus sine theta, we end up with the following. This term picks up an overall minus sign, a plus from this, a minus from this. Whereas this term picks up an overall plus sign because you have a minus here and a minus for the term outside here. So, the value for minus n, the term for minus n is very very similar to the term for plus n. Except for a different coefficients of course and a change of sign here. However, instead of taking both these terms, we could have just taken their sum and that would have given us something very very similar with a n minus a minus n sitting here and b capital N plus b capital minus n sitting here. This is of course the sum of the small n equals capital N and small n equal to minus capital N term. Add it together. Now, once you have done that, all you need to really do is don't bother to take the negative integers at all. Take only the positive integers, sum up over them, but with these coefficients a capital N minus a minus capital N and this one b n plus b minus capital N being replaced by constants a n and b n respectively. Now, since the ANs and BNs are arbitrary constants at this stage, it does not really matter whether you talk of the original A capital N or this combination as A capital N. And that is exactly what we do. The negative integers are dropped simply because they give you essentially the same terms up to the overall coefficient and possibly a sign as those in the original positive N. So, if you take only the positive n, that suffices. In a more technical language, negative integer n's essentially give you solutions which are linearly dependent on the ones with positive n. And as a result, since you are going to do a linear combination anyway, you don't really have to take them both. One would be enough. Now, this does not really answer why you do not take the n equal to 0 term. Now, it might seem that there is a very simple reason to leave out the n equal to 0 term. If you take this term for any small n and put in small n equal to 0 here, this simply vanishes. Now, this is a term which goes into a sum. So, if it simply vanishes, there is no need to include it which seems like a perfectly legitimate reason why we are dropping the n equal to 0 term from the sum. However, that answer is not quite correct. To see why, we need to go back to the original differential equations, the ordinary differential equations, which we solved to end up with our solutions here. Now, when small n is 0, that actually means small k, the separation constant, n pi over capital N is 0. So, the differential equation for capital X actually turns out to be this. d2 capital X dx2 equals minus k square x. This of course was the equation always. But now with k equal to 0, this is d2 capital X dx2 equals 0. Now, a solution to this equation does not happen to be a combination of sine 0 times x and cos 0 times x. The solution here is of course something which is very simple. We all know the solution. It's simply a times x plus b where a and b are again arbitrary constants. So, arguing that putting in small n equal to 0 makes sine m pi x by l vanish is not really a correct argument because sine n pi x by l is not even a solution to our equation for n equal to 0. However, ultimately the conclusion that we made using that argument is still valid, but for a really different reason. Remember, we still have to fit in the boundary conditions for each and every one of these terms. Now, if you try to impose the boundary conditions capital X at 0 is 0, this immediately tells us that capital B is 0, 
And then if you put in capital X at L is also 0, it tells you A times L is 0 and L of course is not 0. So it tells you that capital A also has to be 0. Which means the only solution of this kind which vanishes at both ends will actually vanish identically. This is also easy to understand geometrically because after all, A times small x plus B is just the equation of a straight line and a straight line which goes through y equal to 0 at two points must be nothing other than the x-axis itself. That is, it has to have y equal to 0 throughout. So this term has to be dropped, not because sin n by x by l vanishes when n is 0, but because the actual solution that you have for small n equals 0 also vanishes identically if you try to impose the boundary conditions. Now, at this stage, we are also in a position to answer the question, why did we take a negative separation constant in the first place? Why did we say 1 over capital X d2 capital X dx2 is minus k square? After all, all we have shown from the separation of variables argument is that it is a constant. Why a negative constant? Well, Instead of taking minus k square, suppose we had tried a positive constant, let's say plus kappa square. Again, assuming that kappa is a real number, so that plus kappa square is positive. Now here, if you look at the capital X equation, you are going to get this. Now this implies that the solution is going to be something different from sines and cosines. It's going to be e to the power kappa x times capital A plus e to the minus kappa x times capital B. The character of the solution is now exponential and not sinusoidal. Now, if our wave had extended all over the real line, that is if you could get to arbitrarily large or arbitrarily small values of small x, then it's obvious that this cannot be a decent solution because it's going to blow up either because of this term at large positive x or because of this term at large negative x. And so if you don't want it to blow up at either endpoints, capital A and capital B must be zero, so the solution must vanish identically. Which is of course the reason why we cannot use it in the sum or we do not need to use it at a term in the sum and something which vanishes identically might just as well be dropped. However, if you have a bound string wave in a region which is limited at both sides, then the argument is slightly different, but essentially the same conclusion comes up. If you demand that capital X at 0 is 0 for the boundary condition, this immediately tells us that A plus B is 0, so B is actually minus A. And if you then on top of that demand that capital X at L is 0, then you get a e to the power kappa l plus b e to the power minus kappa l equals 0. And using the fact that b is minus a according to this equation, you end up with a times e to the kappa l minus e to the minus kappa l equals 0. Now this means of course that either a is 0 or this factor is 0. That is, either a is 0, which of course is not the solution we want to worry about because if capital A vanished, with b equal to minus a already there, that would mean that this solution would identically vanish. So this corresponding term in the sum, capital X of x times capital T of t for this particular value of kappa, does not need to be included. It's zero identically. Otherwise, you must have e to the kappa l equals e to the minus kappa l. But e to the kappa l equals e to the minus kappa l can only be true if e to the twice kappa l is 1 and that tells us that kappa must be 0 which of course is ruled out based on the argument that we had used just a while ago. In other words, if you had chosen a positive separation constant, the solution you would have obtained would have to vanish identically once you either demand that the wave has to be finite all over the real line or, as in this case, demand that the wave has to satisfy boundary conditions which tells us that at 0 and L, the wave vanishes. 
Now, if you are aware of complex numbers, which most of you of course are, you might see a loophole here. You might argue that e to the 2 i's kappa L equals 1 can also happen for complex kappa. After all, our separation constant has to be a constant. We did not necessarily demand that it has to be a real constant, although that does seem like what it should be. After all, capital X of X and capital of T of T are both real numbers. But for the time being, let's just assume that you can also have constants, separation constants, which are complex. Then, e to the twice kappa L equals 1 actually means e to the twice kappa L would be e to the power twice n pi times i, which would tell you that kappa is i times n pi over L. And that would, of course, give you a solution where capital A can be non-zero, so you don't really have to worry about an identically vanishing solution. But if you think about it a bit, small kappa equals i n pi over L is the same thing as kappa square is minus n square pi square over L square, the negative separation constant minus k square that we had actually found out. So even allowing kappa to be a complex constant does not change anything for us. We still end up with the solution that we had already known, that with a negative separation constant. Other than that, in all other cases, you are going to get an overall zero coefficient, which means you do not need to take that term into account in your sum. With that out of the way, let us now discuss the procedure for determining the coefficients a n and b n from the initial conditions. Now, as a first step towards figuring out these coefficients a n and b n, let us first try to figure out what del u del t is going to be in terms of these coefficients. That's pretty straightforward. All you have to do is differentiate this expression, the one on the right here, with respect to t. And that will give you del u del t at x comma t is a sum, again from 1 to infinity for n, of n pi v over L, sine of n pi v over L, times minus a n sine n pi v over L times t, plus b n cosine n pi v over L times t. Now, plugging in t equal to 0 here, in the expression for u x comma t and the expression for del u del t, x comma t gives you the following. Firstly, u of x comma 0 is u 0 x can be rewritten simply by plugging in t equal to 0 here, which means this will give you 1 and all of these will vanish and so you will get simply this condition. Sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a n times sine n pi x over l equals u naught x. Similarly, doing the same thing to the expression for del u del t and setting that equal to v naught x gives you a very similar relationship. There, of course, all these terms vanish and these just become bn. So you get sum over n, n running from 1 to infinity of n pi v by l bn sin n pi x by l equals v naught x. Note that these two expressions are essentially of the same form. In one, the coefficients are a n. In the other, the coefficients are n pi v by l into b n. However, one major problem that should strike you if you have not met the topic of Fourier series before is that, after all, what we have here is a sum of all a n's treated by certain factors and similarly sum of all b n s weighted by certain factors. If all you have is a sum, you would typically not be able to figure out individual terms from that. For example, if I told you that the sum of 100 terms is 1, without telling you anything else, you will not be able to find out the term from there. However, and this should be very familiar to anybody who has seen Fourier series before, these two expressions are special cases of what are called Fourier sign series and 
they can be inverted. That is, for sufficiently smooth and well-behaved functions u not x and v not x, we should be able to find out the coefficients a n and n by v by l b n and hence b n from these series. Now, this actually hinges on a very useful and simple result that if you take two integers n and n and carry out this integral of sin n pi x over l times sin m pi x over l over this entire interval 0 to l with respect to x, you will end up with 0 whenever m is not equal to n and when m is equal to n, you get l over 2. What that means is if you take this expression for u naught x and multiply this by sin n pi x by l for some specific n and then carry out an integration from 0 to l dx, the result is the same as what we have written on this side. One thing is important, this n is a specific n, so when you replace the u naught x by this infinite series, the summation index has to be changed to something else. We have called it m here. Now, this is an issue which mathematicians might like to debate, but we physicists take it for granted that you can actually interchange the summation and the integration here. Frankly, this requires some amount of mathematical justification and some restrictions on the kind of functions we are dealing with. But in physics, this kind of thing can almost always be done. So we will, for the time being, assume that we can do this. So interchanging the order of the summation and the integration, am comes out of the integral because it does not depend on x at all. And you are left with this integral inside, which is exactly the integral that we wrote down here. Now notice that although this is an infinite sum, only one term of this infinite sum is actually non-zero. All the other terms go to zero. The only one which doesn't is the one where this index m is actually the same as n. And there, of course, the value of the integral is l by 2. So only one term of this sum contributes the nth term, and it contributes a n times l by 2. And that, of course, means that you can immediately find out a n from this expression. Well, if you did the same thing for v naught of x, that is multiplied by sin n by x by l for some integer n, and carry out the integration from 0 to l, you will exactly get an identical expression, except for the term multiplying l by 2, which in this case is a n, will become n pi v by l b n, which is of course the coefficient of sin n pi x by l in the original sum. Now, of course, these two equations can immediately give you the coefficients a n and b n from these equations. a n is simply 2 by l, the integral from 0 to l, of u naught x times sin of n pi x by l, while bn is a very similar expression except that u naught x is replaced by v naught x and the coefficient in front, which was 2 by l for a n, now becomes 2 by n pi v. Now, we have seen that if u naught x and v naught x are given by series like this, then the only choice for a n and b n, these coefficients, are given by these integrals here. However, what we should really worry about is the following. If we take these a-n's and b-n's as defined by these equations, plug them back in our series for u naught and v naught, these two expressions, do we really get back the functions u naught of x and v naught of x? Now that may seem to be a trivial question to ask. After all, we assume that the series gives you u naught x and v naught x and use that to find out the coefficients a n and b n in the first place. But if you think about it a bit, you would realize 
that that is really a non-trivial and rather deep question. What we have shown is if u naught x can be written like such a series, then the ans have to be given by the expression, the integral that we had worked out. However, it is not guaranteed ab initio that u naught x can be written like such a series. And if that happens, your entire endeavor will fail. So what we are saying here is the following. If for a given u naught of x and v naught of x, we can determine all the coefficients of an and bn and put them back in the series and you actually do get u naught x and v naught x, then the sum that we had written down for u x t, the sum with lots of ans and bns, satisfy the wave equation satisfy the boundary conditions and now has been shown to satisfy the initial condition as well. And therefore, this has to be a solution to the problem. Now the only question is, using these ANs and BNs, can we reconstruct the u naught of x? And the answer to that is almost always yes. Fourier's theorem, the theorem about series which involves sines and cosines guarantees this fact, the fact that ans and bns will help you reconstruct the functions u0 of x and b0 of x. It guarantees this for reasonable u0 of x and v0 of x. Right now, let us not worry too much about what exactly reasonable means. Almost always, every situation that we will meet in physics will fall under this reasonable category. We will now turn to a problem which will give us an example of how this calculation is actually carried out in practice. The problem that we will carry out is one that should be pretty familiar from the previous lecture. This is the case of a string that is bound at x equal to 0 and x equal to L and has been plucked at the middle and raised through an height h and held there and then let go from rest. Because it has been released from rest, the initial rate of change of u with respect to t is 0, v naught x at 0 is 0. The u naught x, which essentially describes the shape of the string here, is also pretty simple. When x is less than L by 2, that is in this region, it is rising linearly as x goes by, so it's given by twice h by L into x. The factor of twice h by l is determined simply to ensure that when x is equal to l by 2, the limiting value for this expression does become h. Now for the other half of the string, that is from l by 2 to l, when x is greater than or equal to l by 2, the expression is 2h over l, the same slope but negative at this time, times l minus x. Note that this too will ensure that at x equal to l, u is 0, and at x equal to l by 2, u is back to being h. So the initial conditions are given by this simple piecewise function here. Now comes the job of figuring out a0 and b0, an and bn, the coefficients, from u0 of x and v0 of x. That is, we have to make use of these equations. Now since the v0 x is 0 in this particular example, all of these bn's would vanish. So bn's are 0 for this particular problem. What remains then is to calculate the an's. That is actually not too hard a task. If you write down the integral, this is what you have to calculate of course. And then realize that u0 x is defined in a piecewise manner. So you have to break the interval of integration into different pieces. So this becomes the integral from 0 to L by 2 of twice h by L into x times sin n pi x by L dx multiplied overall by 2 by L. And that of course is only one of the two terms. The other term can be obtained using this region from L by 2 to L. And here u naught x becomes 2h over L, L minus x. 
Now what we will do here is simply change x to l minus x. In the second integral, strictly speaking, we should really be saying that x prime is l minus x. Write everything in terms of x prime and then finally maybe change x prime to x. Here, we are just seeing x goes to l minus x, which is an abbreviation for this whole procedure. Now, if you do that, the limits will change. When x was l by 2, that is at the lower limit, this new x, l minus x, will also be l by 2. What will change here drastically is the upper limit. The l here will change into 0. That is exactly what happens to x when you carry out the l minus x transformation. Now, of course, 2h by l here has already been combined with this 2 by l. That has been done with both the integrals. The rest is simple. l minus x has become x. Sine of n pi x by l has become sine of n pi l minus x by l or alternatively n pi minus n pi x by l. Now, this essentially tells us what to do. Sine of n pi minus theta for any theta is given by sine theta itself, but the factor in front is minus 1 to the power n minus 1. What that means is that for odd integers, odd values of n, sine of n pi minus theta is actually sine theta. For even values of n, it is minus sine theta. Now, having settled that, let's go back to the integration at hand. This expression is something we have not touched yet. We have been focusing on the second expression. But now notice that this sine of n pi minus n pi x by L can be changed into sine n pi x by L with an overall factor of minus 1 to the n minus 1 coming out. This immediately tells us that if n were an even integer, this will become a minus sign and these two integrals being identical, what you will end up with is 0. So for even n, the a n's are 0. What about odd n's? For odd n's, this number is plus 1. So these two just simply add. So the resulting value for a n is just double or 8 h by l squared times this particular integral. This of course does not mean that our job is over we still have to work out this particular integral. Now that is pretty straightforward using this result. The t sine t, when you integrate that with respect to t, gives you minus t cos t plus integral of cosine t dt. You have gone from here to here by simply using integration by parts. Keeping t unchanged here and integrating sine t to give you the first term in integration by parts, and using that integral times the derivative of t which happens to be 1 in the second term. And now the integral is pretty easy to calculate. It's simply sine t minus t cos t. So here, when you are integrating this, the obvious thing to do would be to choose 9 pi x by l as some variable, let's call that t, and rewrite this integration in this form you are going to get a factor of n pi over l to the power minus 1 from each of x and dx. And that's exactly what you have here. You get l square over n square pi square times the integral of t sine t dt. And the integral now has to be for the corresponding values from 0 to l by 2. That is, if you put in 0 here, in n by x by l, you of course get 0. When you put in L by 2 here, you get n pi by 2. So this is the integral you have to do. We have already worked out the result. So take that and plug in 0 to n pi by 2, the two limits. At the lower limit, 0, both of these terms obviously vanish. 1 because sine t is definitely 0 for the lower limit. So is t cos t because of the presence of this t factor. So the integral 
that we need to calculate becomes L square over N square pi square times sine of n pi by 2 minus n pi by 2 cosine of n pi by 2. Now, note that cosine n pi by 2 would of course vanish for all odd integer n. And that is the kind of n that we are looking for. which are 1 more than multiples of 4 give you plus 1, 3, 7, 11, 15, etc. which are 3 more than multiples of 4 or equivalently 1 less than a multiple of 4, that kind of odd integer will give you minus 1. So, the values that we get ultimately are the following. We have already known that a n is 0 for even n. Among the odd n's, for the type 4n plus 1, you end up with plus 8h by n square pi square. And you get the negative sign for n of the kind 4n plus 3 or equivalently 4n minus 1, that is 3, 7, 11, etc. Now taking these into account, you can write down the entire series u x comma t, the complete solution. You will have an 8h by pi square term, which is there in every one of the terms. And then you have sine pi x by l cosine pi vt by l. That's just a 1 by 1 square. But then you get the n equal to 3 term with minus 1 by 3 square. So minus 1 ninth sine 3 pi x by l cosine 3 pi vt by l. Then the n equal to 5 term is a plus sine 1 by 5 square, sine 5 pi x by l cos 2 by v t by l and so on. So we have an infinite series which when summed up will give you the value of u of x at m d t. And we have found the solution to our problem of the plug string. This is actually a complete solution of the plug string problem. It satisfies the boundary condition. It satisfies the wave equation. It also satisfies the initial condition. However, we have already solved this problem in a previous lecture and seen that the shape of the curve or the string at any given instant is actually like a trapezoid, which shrinks lower and lower and then flips over to the other side, keeps on growing on the other side until it becomes a triangle again, then keeps on shrinking and so on. Now, this is not easy to figure out from this series. You actually can do that by essentially trying to figure out what exactly would be the Fourier sine expansion of a trapezoid and seeing that this actually matches that. So, although this gives you a perfectly good solution, this may not really be good, at least directly, in terms of understanding what the shape is like. You can, of course, make use of a computer and add up sufficiently many terms of the series and plot that and really get to see the trapezoidal behavior. I would however say that if, if the shape of the string is what you really want, the D'Alembert solution approach that we carried out in the previous lecture would definitely beat this method hands down. The advantage of this separation of variable methods, however, is in the following you can actually see that there are various different frequencies which are there in the vibration of the string. And when the string actually is connected to a sound box to amplify the sound, the sound you hear will also have those frequencies. So you see that there is a fundamental smallest frequency and then you have the third harmonic, three times that frequency. 
3 pi v by l, then you have 5 pi by v by l, 7 pi v by l. So in this particular case, when you take a string and you pluck it right in the middle, what you are going to get are odd multiples or odd harmonics of the fundamental frequency pi v over l. So one important thing is that none of the even harmonics are present. That's something we saw a long time ago. An turned out to be zero even before we completely carried out the integral. Now this is a special case of what is called the Young-Helmholtz theorem, which states the following. Harmonics which have nodes at the point of plucking are absent in the resulting waveform of a plucked string. So if you pluck right in the middle, those harmonics which would vanish at the midpoint, the second, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth, that is all the even harmonics, they go missing in the final result. So the sound you hear from a string which has been plucked at the middle will actually have the fundamental frequency or multiples of that frequency mixed up, which will give you a sound, which is what we recognize as music, of course, not just the fundamental, but a mixture of the fundamental with the higher harmonics. But important point is, you do not get all the higher harmonics. In this case, the even ones are missing. Depending on where you pluck, different kind of harmonics would go missing. In what is left of this lecture, I would like to indicate how the young helmholtz theorem is actually proven. The proof actually is quite simple, though it's a bit of a lengthy calculation. If you were to plug the string at a distance a from one end, that is at x equal to a, and pluck it to a height of h, then the initial shape of the string, u naught of x, will be given by h over a times x for x between 0 to a, that's just this straight line. Then you have a downward sloping straight line, which attains the value of h at x equal to a and 0 at the value l. And this immediately gives us the equation is h over l minus x by l minus a. As you can easily check, this expression has the value of h when x is a and definitely vanishes when x equals l. So this describes the shape of the string. Now, all you have to do is calculate the Fourier coefficients, the ans, which tell you how much of each mode is present. As before, this is a plucked string. It's being released from rest, so v0x is 0. All the bns are 0, so we don't need to bother about them. ans are given by the by now familiar integrals and which, of course, has to be broken up into two pieces. The 0 to L integral breaks up into a 0 to A integral and an A to L integral with u naught x taking two different forms in the two parts. Now, this integral can be carried out pretty easily by simply integration by parts. I'm not going to go into the details of the calculation. You can easily carry that out. And once you do this and substitute on the, all the limits and so on, what you will get is actually a pretty straightforward, simple result. A n works out to be this. This is really just a simple evaluation of the integral. What is important is a factor sign n pi a by l here. Now, sin n pi a by l is nothing but the value which sin n pi x by l, the x dependence of the harmonic, of the term in capital X of x times capital T of t, has at x equal to a. So if that particular term sin n pi x by l vanishes at x equal to a, that is, if it has a node there, then the corresponding a n also vanishes. And so if the nth harmonic has a node at a, you end up with a n equals 0, which is the Young-Helmholtz law. That particular 
term will go missing in the infinite sum that you have. Those harmonics will not be present in the resulting sound. Now, let me finish this talk with one piece of information about Indian science. This was a work of the great C. V. Raman who wrote a paper whose title you can see on the left here. It's called On Some Indian Stringed Instruments. And you can see in the contents of that paper that you can see written there, number three says the failure of young Helmholtz law. So what C. V. Raman showed was that because of the special way in which they are constructed, Indian string instruments violate the young Helmholtz law. And that is because in most Indian string instruments, the string is really not bound between two ends. One end may be bound, the other end slides over what is called a cart, a rounded piece of wood, which you would find in say sitar or a veena. Which is why these instruments like the sitar and the veena produce richer sounds because they have more of the harmonics. Those harmonics which would have been missing according to the young Helmholtz law are actually present in these instruments. So on that note, let me say goodbye for this lecture.